Hey, I uh, welcome you to this live uh, video, the B Bible study. We're going to be working on 1 John uh, today and uh, through June and July. And we will meet at 1 o'clock on those uh, dates, except for on 1 o'clock on Wednesdays, uh, except for July 1st, where I'll be on vacation. So, except for July 1st, you can join me at 1 o'clock here. Um, you can also find this in our group feed uh, that day. And then I post them to YouTube, our YouTube station, uh, usually that day or the day after. It's a little complicated to do, so I tend to put it off because, uh, you know what, sometimes I can be like that lazy. So, uh, so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're part of this. Uh, <clears throat> and if you like, if you want to come live, if you want to do this in person, if you're feeling comfortable enough to do that, uh, we had a group at, at 10 o'clock in the morning that came because it was threatening rain. We ended up being in the welcome center and, uh, there were, um, four of us there, five, including me. And we spread out in the welcome center and, um, and, and had the class that way too. Uh, and you know what? And if you come live, then you're going to have a lot of conversation beforehand. We, uh, this lesson is actually only probably about a half hour, 40 minutes tops, uh, but we were there an hour and 10 minutes just because, um, you know, it's nice to catch up with people and see people. So feel free to do either one. I am appreciative of, of whatever you're doing and, and whenever you're coming. Um, and uh, and walk through this good uh, book, uh, A Letter of First John, that, that you probably, if you're like me, don't know a lot about. And so learning about it now is, is kind of fun and exciting. Uh, well, fun, at least. Well... Maybe we'll go with interesting. Maybe fun is like too big of a word for that. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how she goes. Uh, let's start with some prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we uh, celebrate your love that's found us in baptism, uh, that grows us to be uh, your people into the world, announcing the kingdom. Um, as we s dig into this book about light and darkness and good and bad, uh, may we see... Uh, our own fears of, about being in the world in the midst of it and, and our own passion to be part of the world at the same time. That fear and that passion and how they conflict with each other, Lord. Um, help us in this journey of faith, which is what First John is about. Help us live close to you. Uh, we pray for those people we're concerned about, especially we pray for um, our, our members' family uh, today where there was an emergency. Um, Pray for Mindy. Uh, we also lift up our um, Marsha Callis in the hospital and our Leah and Christine uh, in uh, hospice. We pray for all of our cancer patients, uh, people bravely uh, fighting cancer, Joanne and Meg, um, Susan, and uh, <clears throat> Julie, and Kimberly, and Gosh, there's so many more, and I give time for other names to be said now. Here are these people, Lord. Bless them and love them. I love you, God. Amen. Okay, welcome. I'm not sure. Let me see who I got so far here. Just, uh, hi, Reggie, and oh, Susan's here. Hi, Susan. Hope uh, you're fine there. I don't know whether it's raining over there or not. Um, uh... I can't go any further based on that. So I, I can't go any further to see who else is there. So there you go. And I'm not seeing any waving or anything like that. So I hope you're out there. hope you're uh, having a good day. And uh, we will start. So <clears throat> I did post, if you want to go and get that, I did post the, uh, the worksheet for this. Um, if you wanted to go get that, it, it's going to be in that group feed. Just a few, uh, a few things down from this one probably. Uh, for Facebook Live. Uh, basically what I do when we start a new book is I always, uh, that's, I'm in the office now, so that's going to be part of that. Uh, basically when we do face, uh, when I start a new book of the Bible, I always spend the first class just kind of talking about what scholars think about that book, <clears throat> who might have written it, when they might have wrote it, reasons they might have wrote it, who they might have written it to, uh, those sort of things. So we have some context as we begin. Um, so there won't be a lot of discussion at this class because it's just me kind of sharing with you what, what scholars today think. 
Uh, and I always say a caveat, you know, I'm, I'm not a biblical scholar, uh, so I, I didn't like uh, research 30 different uh, uh, writings on that and try to make the best conclusions. I, I went to a couple that were the best. Um, uh, I bought a couple books um, uh, that are feel like the best scholarship that I trust right now by by authors that I know um, and that are have wonderful reputations in the biblical world, Ben Witherspoon and N.T. And Wright. And so that that's who we're working with um, on their ideas. So let's start with the author. Who wrote First John? <clears throat> well, if your guess is John, you know what? You're, you, you, are, you, you, you get a prize because that's not bad. <laughs> uh, you know, most, most uh, scripture in the Bible, other than Paul's letters, they don't. They don't usually have anyone that says, "Hey, this is uh, Carl out here writing this down." So we have to use deduction. And then there's a thing called early on. People decided uh, who wrote this, and they'd write letters to each other in the second and third and fourth century, and say, you know, Peter's letter or, or James's letter, and that sort of thing. And so the tradition was. So the tradition is is that John wrote this, um, and uh, the tradition is is that the same guy who wrote. The Gospel of John wrote the three letters of John. Uh, the Gospel of John that tells the story of Jesus uh, and these three letters of John at the end uh, of the Scripture, uh, end of the New Testament. Who that John is, it's not likely John of Patmos, the guy from Revelation, who does identify himself. That's probably written by a different person. <clears throat> we think that because of the style, because of the uh, the kind of the historical markers that he gives in there. It seems like a little different time period than when John stuff was written um and the kind of concerns and what christianity looks like and so you know i have one way of being a christian so the things i write are going to reflect that way um you know my my friend uh dion up the street here at reynoldsburg church of christ has another way of being a christian uh you know they're very similar um we both love jesus uh but when you look at our writings and how we get to places and how we make decisions you're going to see differences and so that's the kind of thing they look at um, and then they do really geeky scholarly things like they, they count all the num all the times a word is used and and they find out that one guy uses this word a hundred times and another guy uses that ten times and you know so they're not like the same person so they do crazy weird stuff like that too so it's not the guy who wrote Revelation so the tradition is <clears throat> there's two two traditions that we understand it uh, if you read the Gospel of John. Um, you, you're going to encounter a character who is unnamed, and that unnamed character is called the Beloved Disciple. Uh, and if you were here on Easter, you would have seen the Beloved Disciple made the John resurrection story, because it was Peter and the Beloved Disciple that raced to the, um, that raced to the tomb in, in the uh, resurrection story. So those two uh, <clears throat> raced to the tomb, and, uh, but we don't know who the Beloved Disciple is. Um, the thinking is, is that whoever the beloved disciple is, is the guy who wrote the book of John, the gospel of John and the three letters of John. So that's the thinking. Okay. Now, who's the beloved disciple? That would be the next question, right? So when you ask that question, then what you find out, uh, is there's a lot of opinions. <laughs> so the tradition of the church early on in the second century, they started saying that John, the son of Zebedee, uh, the uh, disciple uh, identified in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three gospel stories. Uh, John, the son of Zebedee, is the beloved disciple that writes the gospel of John and the three letters of John. And John, the son of Zebedee, is a top-tier disciple. You know, we got 12 disciples, but some of them, you know, are nothing but names. But a few of them are kind of active characters in the story, and John, the son of Zebedee, is one of those. He, John, the son of Zebedee, uh, has a couple things where him and his brother just have a, a, a story all to themselves in the Gospels. <clears throat> they also uh, are with Peter often in this leadership group. Jesus went alone with Peter, James, and John. These, these three some seem to be the leaders in this group. Uh, so that's who John, the son of Zebedee, is. Like uh, They went up to the Transfiguration Mountains, those guys did. Um, so the tradition is, is that, and then we also know that John, the son of Zebedee, uh, from writings, early church writings, were also leaders in the early church. So they were leaders for Jesus, and they were leaders after Jesus. Okay? The problem is, is that there aren't a lot of Galilean stories in John. Okay. 
don't tune out yet. That's not that complicated to get your head around. John, the son of Zebedee, was a fisherman like Peter, and he grew up in this area of Israel called Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, right? Galilee, there you go, got that. Uh, and there's all sorts of ministry that seems to take place in Matthew, Mark, and Luke around the Sea of Galilee. But John, when John writes the stories of Jesus, he doesn't have any ministry going around the Sea of Galilee, it's, uh, or very little ministry going on around the Sea of Galilee. So it seems weird that for the ministry that that John, the son of Zebedee, would know best that he doesn't include in his own book about Jesus and what Jesus did. So that's kind of what the weird part is that kind of sits in scholars' heads. So then they start dis debating on who else it could be. I'll tell you what, there are all sorts of opinions out there. But the biggest opinion, that if it wasn't John, the son of Zebedee, that it's a guy named Lazarus, okay? And you've heard of Lazarus. So Lazarus is identified in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as, as a close friend of Jesus. Uh, Jesus weeps at Lazarus' tomb. Uh, and he's also identified in the Gospel of John as somebody who's so close that Jesus loved him especially. And, and, and John doesn't say that about anybody else. So you have this beloved disciple and you have somebody who's identified when he shows up in the story as someone who Jesus loves. So that's kind of the other one. That it wasn't one of the disciples at all. It's this close supporter and friend, Lazarus, uh, uh, that wrote it. One thing that people seem to be pretty sure about is, is whether whoever it is, whether it's John, the son of Zebedee, or whether it's Lazarus or somebody else, that it's a first-person account of Jesus. That it's someone who knew Jesus who wrote John, <clears throat> or who at least provided the stories for John. Unlike Mark... Uh, who tells us that he didn't know Jesus, and, and Luke, who tells us he doesn't know Jesus. So that's kind of the difference, um, is that these stories seem to come from somebody who, who, who knew Jesus intimately. And this letter came from someone who knew Jesus intimately. Okay? Um, and then the other thing, when you're thinking about authors, it gets a little more complicated than that because you, sometimes you got to draw a, a second circle. So maybe the guy who knew Jesus intimately was, let's say, John, the son of Zebedee. Uh, and he wrote down or he told people stories in the church that he created and, and, and someone smarter than him wrote him down or, or something like that because he was just a you know, dumb old fisherman. Um, and then that person dies and that person uh, was his deputized second, like, Pastor Liz, I die in office and Pastor Liz is here and, and she's written down all this great wisdom that I've shared all these years with you. Uh, and then I die suddenly and now Pastor Liz uh, moves on and leads this church and, uh, and, and part of the, you know, is, is all these writings uh, uh, that she shares. Uh, in her day, in her day, she would write this as Pastor Liz and she would say, you know, if you remember when Carl was around, he said this. In this day, they didn't do that. So if I was raised up by John, the son of Zebedee, and, I, and John, the son of Zebedee, you know, kind of knighted me and said, you're the next in charge. I would write as if John, the son of Zebedee was still writing and still alive. And that would be completely acceptable. If not acceptable, it would be expected. That's what you do. So, so even though we think there's a first person in here, the person writing these uh these letters and this gospel could be somebody who is um, uh, who's not first person, uh, but yet but yet intimate with that first person. So, so that's what I see. Does that make sense? Oh goodness, how are you guys doing? Good. Looks like I got. Looks like I, I've, I've got four of you here still. That's nice. The um, so <clears throat> what we. Um, the other interesting thing is, is that in John 2, the author identifies himself as John the Elder. John the Elder. Um, or not John, but as the Elder. Um, what we do know, though, um, is that uh, that's an unusual title. So if it was John the son of Zebedee, who was one of the disciples and a pillar of the early church, um, then you would think he would call himself John the Apostle or the Apostle. 
or he'd be called the apostle because that was the formal title for these guys, um, or even disciple. So the elder is weird. Um, an elder is a word that has meaning in the early church. It was what they called their leaders of the church, um, just like many congregations call their leaders elders now. And elder was also what it, exactly what it means, right? An elder is um, is somebody who uh, who's an elder statesman of the church. You know, we have those at our congregation. We uh, in church lingo we call those matriarchs and patri- patriarchs, right? I mean, kind of someone who's been around for a long time and uh, and and is someone you go to for wisdom. Um, uh, Susan Motor is, is online now. Ron Motor, uh, Susan's husband. Um, uh, until Ron left uh, and Ron and Susan went to Apple Valley, Ron w- was one of those elders that I relied on in this church uh, to give me wisdom uh, as I made decisions. Who who kind of who kind of shaped this church uh, by their thirty years of service in it um, and and participation in the community. So yes, yeah, so, so that, that's what an elder is too. And so so whether this guy is one of those or one of, or, or a formal leader, we don't really know. Uh, the Greek shows that he's someone who knew, uh, who was educated, whoever wrote this down. But maybe the guy who he said, hey, you over there, smart one, write this down. <laughs> so it could have been that. So that may or may not have been John and Zebedee but, uh, or Lazarus, but, but definitely was someone who had been educated. But this is the good thing. He's not terribly educated. He's probably like me, right? You know, and enough to get by, but, but, but no one's going to. Uh, sing their praises. Uh, in fact, if you go to seminary and you have to learn Greek in seminary, like you do in a Lutheran seminary, uh, it would be First John that you would translate often, because it's written pretty simply. You know, it's like a fourth grader wrote it, and so you know, so if you're learning Greek, you want to translate something that a fourth grader wrote. But it's written right. It's like a, a smart fourth grade, but it's still a fourth grader. Uh, if you translate Luke, it's written a lot more complicated, and Matthew's even more complicated. Uh, so you don't translate those usually in early Greek. Uh, you usually translate um, John, First John, uh, or Mark, because those are written a lot more simply. Um, and then finally, whoever the author is, he's someone who's in charge. He's someone who's speaking with authority. Um, and, he's, and he's speaking as if he expects people to listen to him. Uh, and he's also speaking with people that, that he's already earned their respect and their love. He calls them children throughout in a way that's unusual for that time. Um, so we picture, and he calls himself the elder, so most scholars picture him as kind of the elder patriarch uh, of that community, uh, kind of saying, uh, we got this problem, and this is what I think we should do about it. Um, so, uh, so that's who he is. So it could have been someone who was intimate with Jesus, or it could have been someone who uh, who was one ring away from someone who was intimate with Jesus. But when he's writing this down, um, then he's definitely the head of that community, and he's probably an older man uh, at that. So there you go. There's authors. Uh, if you have any questions, I don't have any comments at all, like any waves or anything, so I'm, I'm, I don't know whether that part of my thing's not working or you guys are just quiet today. But if you have any questions about any of that, be sure to pop them up there, and, and I'll circle back and get them. So, um, and any time during this, uh, anything to keep us awake, right? For, instead of just having my bald head talk to you for uh, for forty minutes today. So, let, let's move on to the church then. And if you got questions, I'll circle back to you. Um, the church. So, who's he writing to? <clears throat> so, he's writing to a congregation in First John. He's writing to a church. He might be writing to a group of churches. We think um, <clears throat> tradition tells us that that the community, we'll call it a community that jo- that John is writing to, um, is uh, the Ephesus Church, the church in Ephesus. And um, uh, the Ephesus Church is kind of the uh, the center of the Western province of Asia for the Roman Empire. Okay, and the western province of Asia for the Roman Empire is basically a country we call today Turkey. Um, and if you know anything about the Roman Empire, then you might know that eventually they kind of split in two, and there was a western Roman Empire and an eastern Roman Empire. 
and that Eastern Roman Empire became uh, centered in Turkey and Constantinople, and uh, and the Western Roman Empire centered in Rome. So it split in half. I tell you all that to tell you that this was an important part of Rome in the first and second century. That 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 this was a lot of money was made for Rome here, and they had a lot of commerce here, and and, and then they reached out to their farthest part of their empire out of out of that Turkey area where Ephesus is. Um, and there's also a lot of Jewish people in Ephesus and in that surrounding area. Uh, and the reason there were a lot of Jewish people is because it's got a land bridge to um, Israel. You can travel along the shore of the Mediterranean and get up to Ephesus uh, from Israel. It'd be a day's journey back then, but but you could do it. And, and, and the reason that Jewish people did this uh, wasn't necessarily because they migrated out of Israel, but because they continually got conquered by other uh, empires. And when an empire came in and conquered back in the day, uh, they did a, a cute little thing called ethnic cleansing, where they went into your village and, 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 uh, and sent everybody out of the village and emptied it out and and then brought people from another village 200 miles away and gave them your village. And they moved you to another village uh, 300 miles away. And so because it's fairly close to Israel, we ended up with a lot of people up in this, a lot of Jewish people up in, up in this Turkey area around the time of Jesus. Um, and ethnic comes and they also just came into your village and killed everybody too. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know what? People were shits back then, and people are shits back now. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Uh, yeah, war and people's ability to be inhumane to each other is it just never seems to cease. Okay, uh, churches. So he's, he's writing to a church. We're pretty sure about this. Tradition tells us this, and this makes sense from the story. Uh, that's based in Ephesus, um, probably around 80 to 100 A.D., um, now, if, if you're a good Bible scholar, which I'm sure you are, that's why you're still alive with me here after 20 minutes of me talking, uh, then you know that we have a church in Ephesus because <clears throat> Paul talks about a church in Ephesus. He even writes a letter to a church in Ephesus, uh, and that church is called Ephesians. And if you read the book of Acts, which we read the last time, you know that the, the church in Ephesus that Paul started was a source of consternation for him, and, and it was part of the plot that ended up getting him killed. Um, so you go, oh, wow, so John and Paul must have been part of the same church. This is where it gets kind of complicated and, and fun, if, if you want to call this fun. Um, we think that the church that the person who wrote John was a part of in Ephesus is different than the church that Paul was a part of in Ephesus. Um, they knew each other, likely, because, you know, it's not that big of a place and it's a small Christian community, right? Uh, but they had different leaders and different ideas. And we think what the differences were was the one that John was a part of was very Jewish. And what Paul was a part of was, was full of Gentiles. Um, and there was a lot of conflict between Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles is just another word for people who aren't Jewish. Um, and so... We, the writing of this letter uh, is to a, con to a congregation that, that's in conflict because they've had people join them and then not get along with them and then leave and take people with them when they leave, causing schisms. And that sounds like what could happen if uh, Paul's church and, uh, and John's church tried to coexist in the same city. Uh, and we also know from Acts that Paul had some real conflict in Ephesus uh, with people who didn't get along with him having Gentiles around, uh, which sounds like what would happen with John's church. And so Paul's conflicts could be with John's church, just as John's conflicts could be with Paul's church. Uh, maybe they aren't conflicts towards each other, because maybe this is well past where John and Paul are still alive, but, but their later churches are still having these conflicts as they grew up next to each other. It would be like, it would be like, you know, a Lutheran church in, in Reynolds, Messiah, uh, and, uh, and Reynolds, Brigham United Methodist down the road, where, you know, we're, we're real close to being the same. Uh, but we sent over uh, uh, Rodney uh, there, who's, who's online now, over to Reynolds, Brigham United Methodist to kind of implant himself and, uh, 
and, and then maybe steal away 10 or 20 of those people or something like that. So maybe that's the kind of conflict they have. Uh, we're not sure. So there you go. Um, but that's what we think it is. We think it's a, it's a Christian community that's having conflict with another Christian community. And in Ephesus, that's easy to understand from the, what we have. Um, it, it, um, we think John's is a Christian, a Jewish Christian community because it's very Jewish writing uh, for the day. It's called Jewish wisdom literature, uh, which was really popular in the first and second century. Um, we have older versions of Jewish wisdom literature in our own Old Testament, uh, Job and Proverbs and Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach and Ecclesiastes. Uh, those are all Jewish wisdom literature. And and um, in John's day, we had whole communities, um, the Qumran communities, the the most famous one, uh, who who wrote things that look a lot like John in First John. Um, a lot of things about light and darkness and about the world being bad and trying to create a community that was good uh, and not be infected by a bad world. Um, so this is the style that it's written in. And, uh, and it's a well-known style in the area, and it's a very Jewish style. So that's why we think that this is definitely a Jewish Christian congregation. Um, <clears throat> and the reason it's written is because of... Um, is because there's a conflict. Uh, 1 John is, isn't a letter like saying, hey, just thought I'd, 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 I'd ring you up and see how things are going, <laughs> you know, or, or you know, your, your Christmas letter where, you, where you're telling everything great that's happened and leaving everything bad that, has, that, that you don't want your friends to know about. It wasn't one of those. It, it, was, it was like a sermon or like a sermon series or like a teaching. And, and the teaching was from this patriarch to all of his church probably had multiple ones because this is not just a city but it's like a metro area and so there were little house churches scattered and he's saying you know what we got this conflict with other christians in the area and this is how we're going to handle it and this is what we're going to do um and this is why we're going to do it because of who we understand jesus is and our call so that's that's the purpose of the letter it's a teaching on how to live right as christ in the world um, and it's beautiful, inspiring sort of language uh, about loving our neighbor, even when our neighbor hates us, um, which is one of the things I've always appreciated about it. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that seems to be it. That, that, that seems to be the reason that it's written. Uh, and we can tell that just by reading it and knowing. Uh, it's dated usually around 80 to 100 A.D. Sometimes people have it up as high as 130 A.D., you know, in that ballpark. If you think about Jesus being alive um, in the first 30 years of the millennium, so 0 to 30 A.D., uh, Paul seems to start shortly after Jesus was killed, within four or five years. And he's written a letter already within 10 years of Jesus. I think it's First Thessalonians is the first letter that Paul wrote. Um, you know, we date that to around the early 40s. Um, so within 10, letter, 10 years, Paul's writing all these letters. And our gospel stories of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't get written, we don't think, until 70 A.D. to 80 A.D. Uh, and John was probably one of the last ones of those. Mark was probably the first one written, and John was probably the last one that was written. Um, and, uh, and, and the scholars that I read in preparation for today seem pretty confident that it was before 100 A.D. Uh, and likely in the 80s. Um, so... For reasons that I don't think I remember it had to do with who was alive when and who referenced it when and that sort of thing um, so there you go <clears throat> and then the final thing I want to say is that first John is related to second John and third John most scholars think that the same person wrote all three um, the value of second and third John the early church wasn't sure of. And so there was a lot of debate on whether to keep them or not. They are real letters. Second John is written to a church, one congregation, and third John is written to a person. And they're really short, like a letter would be. They would fit on one sheet of parchment, which is what you would have for a letter. Just like when I try to send out letters to you, I try really hard not to make it a two-page letter. I try to make it fit on one sheet. And they did the same thing then. 
and second and third John do fit on one sheet. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so, but but they're written by the same person. They think, uh, and then there's some debate on whether the same person who wrote First John, Second John, and Third John is the same person who wrote John the Gospel, or if it's one ring out a follower of that person. Uh, and the reason they think that uh, isn't as much about language being different as it is uh, at the end of John, it seems to indicate that the beloved disciple is dead. Uh, and if that's the case, then he couldn't have written this. Um, but if it's the case that the beloved disciple died 10, 20 years later, and, and this elder is was his faithful companion, uh, then that could be the case. So, so it's just hard to tell because, you know what, we're just making best guesses. Huh. So that's everything. I'm not sure why. Um, that's everything I had. So I told you it'd be a, a closer class. I'm not sure why I had no comments today. So um, maybe that's just because of people's engagement. So I don't have anything else to react to uh, other than to say next week, if you want to write this down, I'm going to be back at one o'clock and we're going to have a, a deep dive into the first chapter of First John. So First John 1, 1 to 2, 2. First John 1, first John 1, 1 to 2, 2. Uh, June 17th. So tune back in and hopefully I'll have some good interactions, some good questions like we were having during Acts. Uh, and if you like, uh, show up at 10 in the morning and, and hear that live uh, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. Be safe, people. I hope you're okay. Uh, I miss I miss seeing your faces. And your smiles. Uh, and even some of you with real ugly faces. I, I miss seeing those faces too. Uh, bye bye guys. Love you.